So the next section we're going to cover today, the last section in chapter three that we're going to cover, like I mentioned before, this is not one I usually cover at UCI. So if I have no idea what I'm talking about, just know that nothing in this section is that hard, but also I literally haven't thought about it in like five years because I think I taught it at another community college a long time ago. Anyway, let's get started. So hyperbolic functions are a new kind of function. You might wonder why they exist and we'll sort of get into it in a little while. But, so they're, they're basically, they model trig functions. There are the three basic, well, the two basic kinds, and then all of the other ones are some kind of combination of the two of them. So this is basically what we call hyperbolic cosine. Now, that, since that's really annoying to say, uh, usually most people just say cinch. They say cinch. And then this is hyperbolic cosine, which people say cosh. That one makes more sense because there's, there's no C in this. So that doesn't really make sense to call it cinch, but we call it cinch. Anyway, and you can see they're just what we would call linear combinations, which if you take algebra, you'll, or linear algebra, you'll see what that means, of e to the x and e to the negative x. So cinch x is e to the x minus e to the negative x, and you just divide that by 2. And then cosh x is e to the x plus e to the negative x, but you do plus, you add them up, and then divide by 2. You've got to memorize these. I probably won't ask a lot of questions, but they'll pop up. Probably they'll mostly pop up in like, if I just give you a problem that's like, find the derivative and here's a function, here's a function, here's a function. Like, there'll probably be a, one of these hyperbolic functions in there. And then tanch, yep, tanch. Uh, that's just cinch over cos. Just like tangent is sine over cosine, tanch is cinch over cos. And then I don't even know how to say that. Hyperbolic cosecant, that's just one over cinch. Just like cosecant is one over sine, cose co hyperbolic cosecant is one over hyperbolic sine. And then same thing with, I don't know how to say that one either. None of these you can say. There's, I don't know how to say them. I, don't, I literally don't know how to say them out loud. Hyperbolic secant is just 1 over hyperbolic cosine. Um, hyperbolic cotangent is, is cosh over cinch. But no, this is just 1 over... That is just 1 over tanch, right? So they're all exactly the same. There's, there's, there are differences between these functions and trig functions. For one thing, their graphs don't look anything alike, as you might imagine based on what they're defined to be. But there are differences. But as far as like the basic identities go, these, these are the basic ones, like this and these guys. They're all the same. OK? So this is this. I have some graphs here. So this is what cinch looks like. Kind of looks like a cubic function, but not exactly. So this is, no, this is 1 half e to the x. And this is negative 1 half, uh, negative 1 half e to the negative x. So if you added up this function and this function, you would get this guy. OK? And then cosh looks like this. It almost kind of looks like a parabola, because here's 1 half e to the negative x. Here's 1 half e to the x. And if I added them up, this is what I would get. It's like I said, it's, it's almost parabolic looking. It's not a parabola, I don't think, but it kind of looks like it. OK. This should actually be linear growth, right? As x goes to infinity, this is basically just going to be this guy plus this guy. Now, this guy is going to be 1 half e to the x, so that grows exponentially. This guy's going to get close to zero as x goes to infinity. So basically, you have this thing growing exponentially plus this other small guy. So this growth right here will actually be exponential, right? It's going to follow along this curve. And this is an exponential growth curve, 1 half e to the negative x. So it's going to follow that along. It's always going to be a little bit bigger. This is always going to be a little bit bigger than this. But when x is really big, they'll be about the same. I can't imagine really needing to know this. But let me, let me tell you, the book does not use this at all. Because if you go through other sections, none of these functions ever appear in the work. So anyway. And here's tanch. Tanch kind of looks like um, kind of looks like uh, arctangent or tan inverse. Same thing, arctangent and tan inverse. Kind of has the same graph. If it was arctangent, this would be pi over two, and this would be negative pi over two. This line It'd be y equals pi over two, y equals negative pi over two. Anyway, uh, so what are these used for? So if you have what's called a, a geometric figure called a catenary, which a catenary. So I believe uh, catena or catena. I don't know how to pronounce it. It's Latin for chain. And the basic idea would be if you had a tower here and a tower there, like a bridge, like I say a suspension bridge, and you just had one end of the bridge there, one end of the bridge there, right? It would make this sort of, like, I don't know, it would kind of sag, right? It would give you a shape like that. And those shapes are actually given by hyperbolic functions. So this, this catenary is given by a constant c. I don't know what c is. It might be the height of the, it might be the height of the tower, but it might just be, I shouldn't walk away from my recording. Uh, 
it might just be the height of like one minus like this thing over here. It probably depends on what a is. Anyway, so it's c a constant plus a is, a is constant here. So it's c plus a cosh x over a, and it gives you that catenary shape. So these functions do have their real world purpose. Like they do give you, they do model real life on some level, like real, real life physical situations. Okay. Okay. So we have some identities that are similar to uh, real trick identities. So this first one, cinch of negative x is negative cinch x. All of this that this says is that cinch is an odd function. Remember, even in odd functions, this is the definition of an odd function. If I plug in negative x, do I get negative f of x? And we do. So just like sine, sine is an odd function. Cinch is an odd function as well. And just like cosine is an even function, cosh is also an even function, right? So cosh of negative x, this gives me cosh of x. Now, the Pythagorean identities are a little bit different. It's not cosine squared x plus sine squared x equals 1. Now, it's cosh squared x minus cinch x is 1. And then, if this were regular trig, this would be 1, pl one plus tangent x squared x equals secant squared x. So let me just write down the for trig. So for trig, the Pythagorean identities... How would, they, how would they look different? So again, these are kind of annoying that you might have to memorize these. I don't think I'm going to test you a lot on this, so don't worry about it too much. I'll probably just throw in a cosh or a, a cinch when you have to take a derivative somewhere. Like it'll just be in a function. Also, I take the derivative of this function, and there'll be a cosh in there. So you should memorize the derivative formulas, which we'll get to. But trig Pythagorean identities. So if you remember for trigonometry, right, it's sine squared x, or it's cosine squared x, plus sine squared x is 1, and it's 1 plus tangent squared x equals secant squared x, like that, okay? So uh, note the differences with the hyperbolic functions, right? Instead of these pluses, they're just minuses. That's the only difference, okay? And then you have an angle sum identity. If you have cinch of x plus y, you get cinch x plus six x, cinch x times cosh y plus cosh x times cinch y. I think... Does anyone actually remember angle sum identities better than me? Is this, is this the same as for trick? I think it is, but I, I never memorize these because I don't need them ever. I think this is the same. This one's different. This is definitely different. There's definitely a minus sign for coach. I'm almost positive. So this one I think is different, but I think this is the same. Anyway, like I said, I don't anticipate you'll need these, so don't worry about them. I think don't memorize these two. I don't care. These ones, remember these maybe that they're just different. All you have to do is remember how are they different from the regular trig ones, and you'll be fine. Okay. Just change the plus and the regular trig identities to minuses. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Let's do this a little example here. Let's prove that. Let's prove the Pythagorean identities. Okay. So we'll do this one first because the second one is actually straightforward if you know the first one's true. So for this one, just use the just use the formulas, right? What is cosh x? So this is going to be e to the x plus e to the negative x over 2, and you square that, and then do the same thing, but now minus e to the x minus e to the negative x over 2, and then you square it. So what you should get is you should get something over 4 over here, right? It's going to be the first term squared, which is going to be e to the x quantity squared, which is just 2x, e to the 2x. Then it's going to be, if I have, so remember, I'm just going to use this formula here. If I have a plus b squared, right? It's the first term squared plus twice their product plus the second term squared. So that means I'm going to get, when I multiply e to the x and e to the negative x, I just get what? What's the product of these two terms? If I multiply this times this, right? I want this 2ab. What is the product of that times that? Anyone know? It's 1, right? They, they cancel out. It's e to the x plus, it's e to the x minus x, which would be e to the 0, which would be 1. So you get just plus 2 times 1, and then you get plus e to the negative 2x. That's the first one. And then the same thing over here, but you'll have a minus, that'll be negative 2. So you'll have e to the 2x. Um, yeah, minus, sorry, plus 2. Uh, min, uh, no, sorry, minus. What am I doing? Minus 2. I was getting ahead of myself. Minus 2, and then plus e to the negative 2x all over 4, and then when you add these together, 
you get e to the 2x plus 2 plus e to the negative 2x. You have to distribute this negative sign, right, to each term. So it's going to give you uh, minus e to the 2x plus 2 minus e to the negative 2x. And everything cancels out except the 2s. And you just get 4 over 4, which is 1. So it's just a algebra. Now, the other one's easier. The other one's easier because if you have this, just take, uh, just take the other one that we already proved, cosh squared. Oops, what just happened there? Cosh squared x. Um, cosh squared x minus cinch squared x equals 1. And just divide both sides. Divide both sides of the equation. By cosh squared. And what you get is the first term over here, right? When you do this, you get 1 cosh squared over cosh squared, which is 1. And then I get minus cinch squared over cosh. Oops. Over cosh squared x equals 1 over cosh squared x. And then, of course, this is just tanch squared, and that's hyperbolic secant squared, right? So you just get 1 minus tanch squared x equals hyperbolic secant squared x. That's it. This is actually the same proof. If Once you know the, the main Pythagorean identity, so this is like the, the main one, even in trig, once you know the trig one, you can get this one by just dividing both sides by cosine, either hyperbolic cosine in this case or regular cosine in the trig case. You can get the other one, right? What is the other one? The one that's 1 plus cotangent squared x equals cosecant squared x. You get that one by dividing this one, the, the main one, by sine on both sides. Anyway, that's it. I don't anticipate giving you a lot of problems where you do identities with hyperbolic functions. I don't really care about this. Any questions? Yeah. I'm kind of just filling time on, on the level of, like, in the semester. It's like, what do I do if I don't teach every optional section? Also? <laughs> it's too much time. Um... I'm used to giving uh, my present, my calculus stuff in way more compact form. What is the point? Okay, so what is the point P? If I have T is just some number, right? What is the point cosine T sine T? If I take the point that has those two coordinates, what, what does that point represent? Does anyone know? If you, take, if you take all the points in the plane that are cosine of T sine of T like that, what, what, what is, what is, uh, where do those points lie in the plane? Anyone know? So we'll think about it. If I were to take the first, the, the x component squared and add to that the y component squared, it would be equal to 1 by the Pythagorean identity, right? Which means that these two points, cosine squared t plus sine squared t equals 1, the point cosine t sine t lies on the unit circle. Right? For some t, it's going to lie on the unit circle. So when like t is 0, it's going to be at the point uh, 1, 0, right? If you go to, say, pi over, uh, pi over uh, 2, it's going to be at the point 0, 1, right? If you just take pi over 4, it's going to be, you go on the unit circle and you go up by pi over 4 radians and you get on that point. So basically, this is what it looks like, right? So t in this case refers to that angle. Like this, this would be the angle t, so t radians, okay? So here's a question. What if I do the same thing, but with, with hyperbolic functions instead? What if I do cosh t, sinh t? What does it do? Well, it actually, and this is why they're called hyperbolic functions and not circle functions or something. If I use hyperbolic functions, it'll give you the same thing, but instead of it for the circle, it'll give it to me for the hyperbola, x squared minus y squared equals 1. It's the same thing. It's what is sort of that point along that hyperbola given th th that angle t, basically. Okay? How many of you guys took uh, pre-calculus or college algebra and did, like, uh, did um, conic sections? Yeah, so if you saw conic sections, you saw, like, hyperbola, but that's where this comes from. Okay, so if you were curious, like, why do these functions exist? Same idea, but if you were dealing with hyperbolas instead, it's sort of like they're sort of analogous to hyperbolas like trig functions are to circles. Okay. okay. Now we take derivatives really, really easily because those functions are pretty straightforward in terms of their derivatives, right? I mean, 
uh, since is just e to the x minus e to the negative x over 2. That's a pretty easy function to take the derivative of, relatively speaking. So there's nothing special. You can just take the derivatives. And there's a little bit of a difference between trig and hyperbolic functions. Notice that the derivative of sinh is cosh. So that matches up right with trig functions, right? The derivative of sine is cosine. So the derivative of sinh is cosh. It's a little bit different for cosh. Look at that. Cosh, the derivative of cosh is positive sinh. It's not negative sinh, right? So the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So it's, there's no negative in there. So that's, that's going to be your cross to bear. That's going to be... The hardest thing to remember about hyperbolic functions is that when you take the derivative of cosh, it's not negative cinch, it's just cinch. Okay. And then everything else is um, the same. Take the derivative of tinch, you get the square of uh, hyperbolic secant. Derivative of hyperbolic cosecant is negative hyperbolic cosecant times hyperbolic cotangent. The derivative of um, hyperbolic secant is, uh, okay, there's a negative sign there. That's, that's the difference too. That one's different as well, right? The derivative of hyperbolic secant is negative hyperbolic secant tan times tan. So remember, if this was just trig, right? For trig, there'd be no negative sign here. So for trig, the derivative of secant is just tangent, secant tangent. Okay. And then for cotangent, it's the same thing. It's the derivative of hyperbolic cotangent is negative hyperbolic uh, cosecant squared. Okay. So these are the these are basically this is the important part of this section. You should memorize those because, like I said, where where are you? Mo I'm not probably going to give you a problem explicitly about hyperbolic functions on a test. Where are you going to see hyperbolic functions? I'm going to say find the derivative of these functions, and I'm going to give you like a through e, and you should take the derivative of each one. There will probably be a hyperbolic function somewhere in there. That's it. So you, you should memorize the form. Maybe maybe if I'm feeling mean, an inverse hyperbolic function, which we'll get to in a minute. All right. Show that the what is this doing? show that the derivative of sinh is cosh and the derivative of tanh is hyperbolic secant squared. Why don't you take a couple minutes and try this out? Okay. Okay. So sorry, just to repeat that, just in case someone's following along at home later. Don't use the quotient rule. I know it's e to sinh is e to the x minus e to the negative x over two, but don't use the quotient rule just because you see over two. Okay. If it's if it's something over a constant. Don't do that. Instead, do the following. Okay? So you do d dx of cinch. x is going to be the derivative of e to the x minus e to the negative x over 2. So that's just the definition of cinch. So what you can do is you can write that as 1 half, or d dx of 1 half times e to the x minus e to the negative x. And the thing is, a constant can just be ignored, right? When you take a derivative, you can just take the derivative outside. So this is the same as 1 half times the derivative of e to the x minus e to the negative x, okay? And so that just avoids the quotient rule altogether. So if you do that, you get 1 half. The derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The derivative of e to the negative x will just be negative e to the negative x. So you get plus, or let me just be explicit here when I write this down. So you'll get minus e to the negative x times negative 1 from the chain rule. And that, of course, will just give you e to the x plus e to the negative x times 1 half, or you can write over 2, which is, of course, cosh x. Okay. Now, to show the derivative of tanch is secant, hyperbolic secant squared, just use the quotient rule, just like we did for tangent. It should be probably the exact same problem almost. So the derivative of tanch, that's going to be d dx of sinh x over cosh x, which now I use the quotient rule. So it's going to be cosh x times the derivative of sinh, so it's the bottom, times the derivative of the top, which is also cosh, minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. So the derivative of cosh is just cinch, not negative cinch, just cinch. So this is where it's different from cosine, because if it was just if it was just cosine, it would be this would be a negative sign, you go plus up here. And then you have cosh squared x in the bottom. But the thing that's okay about this, right, is you have cosh squared minus cinch squared, but that's the Pythagorean identity for hyperbolic functions, right? So that's still equal to one, which is the same thing as it was in in um, trig. So you get, again, cosh squared uh, 
x minus cinch squared x over cosh squared x, and that's going to be equal to 1 over cosh squared x, which, of course, is just hyperbolic secant squared. That's it. So it's almost the same as the trig version. In the trig version, because the derivative of cosine is negative sine, you'd have negative sine here. That would turn this into a plus, and that would allow you to use the trig Pythagorean identity, right? So it's the same problem. It's just It works out that you can use the Pythagorean identity no matter what. Any questions? Okay. All right, why don't you guys try these problems? So here's just some derivative ones. So just buff, just to work on your chain rule problems here, basically. Let's give these a shot here. So for A, the derivative of F, so the outside function is cinch, right? It's, it's a composition of two functions, cinch and root X. So the outside function is cinch. So the derivative of cinch is cosh. So it's just cosh of root x times the derivative of the inside. The derivative of the square root function is 1 over 2 root x. Okay? That's it. Okay? So for b, you can just use the chain rule if you want. It's not that hard. You just do... Oh, you have to use the chain rule anyway. So you could actually... I was thinking of this. You could use the fact that tanch is just secant over or a sine over cosine, cinch over cosh. And you could use the properties of logarithms to break that up into logarithm, natural log of cinch minus natural log of cosh, but it doesn't really make the problem any easier. So you might as well just not bother with that. Um, so again, the derivative of natural log of x is 1 over x. So you get 1 over tanch, oops, looks like an h, times the derivative of tanch, which is just hyperbolic secant squared. So you get hyperbolic secant squared x over tangent. You can probably simplify that, but who cares? It's fine like that. Okay. When I say simplify it, you could break it down into like, well, the cinches and coches and then figure out what you get at the end, but it's fine. For the last one over here, right, see, we need to use the product rule. So you have the first function is cinch and the second function is e to the cosh. So it's going to be the first function cinch times the derivative of e to the cosh x. So the outside function is e to the x, so its derivative is just e to the x. So it should be e to the cosh x, and then times the derivative of the inside function. The inside function is cosh, right? So it should be times cosh, or times cinch, I should say. And then that's the first term. So again, this is the, this right here, right? This is the derivative of e to the cosh x. And then for the second term, it's going to be the second function, e to the cosh x, times the derivative of the first function, so times the derivative of cinch, which is just cosh. And that's it. So if you simplify that a little bit, you get cinch... Get, oops, sorry. You could if... <coughs> making a mess of this. You could, if you wanted to, factor out the e to the cosh x... And then you'd have cinch squared x plus cosh x. That's it. Any questions on any of these? OK. No? Anyone? Sure? OK. So if we go back and look at the functions, if you go back and look at, say, for instance, cinch and tanch, those were one-to-one -one functions. Cosh was not one-to-one, -one, but it was one-to-one -one as long as you were on the interval from, say, zero to infinity. So when those functions are one-to-one, -one, you can define inverse functions. So just using the standard rules, right? So y equals cinch inverse x is the same as saying cinch of y would be equal to y. Uh, y equals cosh inverse x is the same as saying cosh y equals x, and the y is also positive, okay? And then same thing for tangent here. y equals tangent inverse x is equivalent to saying tanch of y equals x. So this is kind of how you can find them. And you can get the following formula. So you get the cinch inverse of x is natural log of x plus the square root of x squared plus 1. Cosh inverse is natural log of x plus x square root of x squared minus 1. And tanch inverse x is just 1 half natural log of 1 plus x over 1 minus x. So here x has to be at least 1, right? Otherwise it's going to be... An, 
complex number, which we don't want. And here, x is, this only works for x between negative 1 and 1. Okay. So let's show that uh, cinch x. Well, actually, let's let you guys try this. Try this out. See, see how you do with this. Take a few minutes. It's not impossibly hard. It's just, uh, it is tough, actually. There's a trick to it. But what I want you to take a minute and see, well, how would you, if I said show this, how would you do that? If you're trying to find the inverse, we're trying to find the inverse function of cinch. So how do you go about finding the inverse function of something like that? So, remember how you solve for the inverse function. So, if we have y equals cinch x, that's the same as saying y is equal to e to the x, or sorry, minus e to the negative x over 2, and then you just switch out x and y, okay? So, you get x equals e to the y minus e to the negative y over 2. And you might be wondering, how do we try to solve for y here? This looks like it's going to be uh, very difficult. And it's not super easy. But it's not that bad either. So the trick here is that you get multiply both sides by 2 to get 2x equals e to the y minus e to the negative y. Subtract 2x from both sides, and you have e to the y minus 2x minus e to the negative y equals 0. Now multiply both sides of this equation by e to the y. And if you do that, you get e to the y quantity squared minus 2x e to the y minus 1 equals 0. Does that help anyone see it? What do you do here? What is that? What kind of function? What kind of equation is this? Well, yeah, it's, it's a quadratic in form. It's what's called, quad, if, you took, if you took college algebra and you used the, the, uh, the McGraw-Hill book that we used, it's called quadratic in form. So in other words, if you think about, just think about x as being a constant. So it's just, x is just constant here. Then what you have is you have a um, uh, a function where you have like a variable e to the y. If you let just say z be e to the y, then you have z squared minus 2x times z minus 1 equals 0. And so that's a quadratic equation. So you can solve for it using the quadratic formula. So z is, I don't think it'll factor. So z is going to be, 
Um, so note that the, the a is 1, the b is negative 2x, and the uh, c is negative 1. So it's going to be negative b, so 2x plus or minus the square root of b squared, so that's 4x squared, uh, minus, um, minus 4 times 1 times negative 1, so it's going to be just plus 4, right? And then all over 2a, which is just 2. Now you can pull out, so you notice that both terms under the square have a 4, right? So I can just factor that 4 out and then pull it out of the root as a 2. So it's going to be 2x plus or minus 2 times the square root of x squared plus 1 all over 2, and I can factor the 2 out, and then I can just cancel out that 2 in the denominator. So what I get is I get x plus or minus the square root of x squared plus 1, and that's it. Now, we're not done yet, because I solved for z. Okay. I solved for z. So, um, add a slide here. So we get z equals x plus or minus um, the square root of x squared plus 1. So we get e to the y is equal to x plus or minus the square root of x squared plus 1. Now, we have to throw away, that's actually two numbers, right? There's actually two numbers. We have to throw one away. Which one do we have to throw it away? Minus. We have to throw away the minus. Why do we have to throw away the minus? Why, why, why can't... I should note that e to the y cannot be equal to x minus the square root of x squared plus 1. Why is that the case? Say again? Because it can't be negative inside of the element. Yeah, well, yeah, that's basically it. But think about this. e to the y, whatever y is, e to the y is a positive number. This is actually going to be a negative number. This is actually negative, right? This is actually negative. So if I write up here, <coughs> oh, other way around, sorry. is actually negative. So Do not have the coronavirus. <laughs> <clears throat> not yet. Um, all right. So yeah. So we have to throw that one out. So that can't be negative. So you can get rid of the negative sign there. Okay. And then finally, just take the natural log of both sides. Okay. And you get. You get that. And so that gives me that cinch inverse x has to be natural log of x plus the square root of x squared plus 1. Okay? That's it. It's tough. It's a tough one to do. But just thought it'd be worth checking out. <clears throat> Any questions? Okay. So, for as far as derivatives go, um, I think, uh, memorize, I'll just tell you, memorize these ones. I, I'm going to say, don't worry about these ones. Okay, Ignore these. 
Memorize those, though. These are pretty similar to their trig counterparts. Uh, sine, sine inverse, it's 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And then um, Cauch inverse would be 1 over, so it would be negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And then for tanj, if it was tangent, this would just be a, a plus right here. Okay, so they're similar. Which should make them easy to remember. If you can just remember the differences between that and the trig ones, it's kind of like you get the, those ones for free. You do, you do have to remember the differences, though. They're, they're small, but worry more about the trick ones. Those will come up more often. Okay. All right, why don't you guys try that one? So remember that what was cinch? Cinch was, if you had it on written down, cinch inverse, I should say, was natural log of x plus the square root of x squared plus 1. Okay. So this is mostly just... A chain rule problem, but give it a try. All right, so, <clears throat> um, let's see. So remember, if you have a function which is just log of something else, right, there's, there's sort of that special, I don't know why it's called special, but it's that quick sort of shortcut for the chain rule. If you, have not, if you have the derivative of natural log of g of x, this is just g prime of x over g of x, Okay, because it's 1 over g of x. That's the derivative of, of, the out, of the outside function natural logarithm. So 1 over g times the derivative of the inside function, which is g prime. So it just simplifies out to be g prime over g. So in this case, then, the derivative of cinch inverse, it's just going to be uh, the derivative of this whole thing. So it's going to be 1 plus, right, you have to do... The derivative of x is just 1, and then the derivative of the outside function is 1 over 2 root. So it's going to be 1 over 2 times the square root of x squared plus 1, and then times the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of x squared plus 1 is the inside now, or x squared plus 1 is the inside, so its derivative is just 2x. So it's going to be all of that all over x plus the square root of x squared plus 1. And if you do that, what do we get? We will get uh, 2x. OK. So this is where it starts to get a little tricky here. Um, a lot of things are going to need to simplify here so to get our, our answer. So I'm just going to multiply this by this 1 by 2 root 
x squared plus 1 over 2 root x squared plus 1. So we get 2 the square root of x squared plus 1 plus 2x over 2 times the square root of x squared plus 1. That's, that's just me simplifying the numerator, right? You can just write 1, write 1 as this over this, right? Just put 1 over a common denominator. So multiply it by 2 square root of x squared plus 1 over 2 square root of x squared plus 1. If I, maybe I should just make one intermediate step here, actually. So we would get the following. You get that's one. So then you get plus two x. Uh, let's just get rid of the twos. We don't need the twos. Let me just so the twos cancel out. You just get x over the square root of x squared plus one, and then all over x plus the square root of x squared plus 1. So now combine those two fractions in the numerator. You get x. I'm going to rearrange the terms, just to make it clear. You get x plus x squared plus 1 over the square root of x squared plus 1 divided by x plus the square root of x squared plus 1. So you have the same thing in the numerator here as you do in the denominator down there. So they will cancel out. and just leave you with just a one there. And so that gives you your answer, one over the square root of x squared plus one. And that's it. So to get it to look nice, it's kind of a, a hassle while, while work, but that's the gist of it. Just mostly doing some algebra. Okay, any questions? All right. That one. Remember the derivative of tanch inverse All right, so this is just a chain rule. So the derivative of tanch, the outside function is tanch, the inside, or tanch inverse, the inside function is, is sinh, or just sine, I guess. So it's just the derivative of the outside function. So this is going to be 1 over 1 minus something squared, the inside function squared. So sine squared x. And then times <clears throat> the derivative of the uh, inside function, which is just uh, the, the inside function is sine, so its derivative is cosine. And this is this is just one, right? So this is cosine x. One minus sine squared x is co oh sorry, it's this is cosine squared x. I should say, not one. Uh, so you get one over cosine x, which is just secant x. No, it's just normal secant.
Okay. That's it. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Um, we have a few minutes. We'll take a quiz today, our last sort of on-paper quiz, or on-paper that you get back to me, please. Um, uh, any questions before we get started? Anything you want to ask? Any uh, problems you want to answer? Yeah. Are you going to continue doing quizzes every week and just have a new quiz? Or have a what? Sorry? They'll probably be given on WebAssign. So I'll probably make a quiz in WebAssign and I'll assign it. It'll be sort of available at like the regular time it would be taken. And then you might have like a little while longer to do it just in case there's some sort of uh, internet problem. But generally speaking, expect to like, expect to take a quiz kind of at a very specific time on Thursdays. So at 4.30 roughly on Thursdays. Okay. Yeah. Hi, can I ask for yeah, sure. Um, I didn't get the one of the problems is e to the power of two t sine two t. I couldn't figure out. Say it again. Uh, e to the power of two t sine two t. Like that? Yeah. And you want what the derivative? Yeah, the derivative. Okay. Okay. Well, so. I don't want to like. There's not. There's not really any point making a big list of like chain rule hacks because I think if you memorize them all, it would just. It's worth. It's easier to just understand the chain rule. But like, if you have the derivative. Of if you say like e to the say the f of x, okay, then the derivative of the the outside function is e to the x. Its derivative is, is e to the x. So your derivative should be e to the f of x, times the derivative of the inside function, which is f prime of x, right? The inside function is f, its derivative is that. So you can use this to just, if, you, if this helps you a little bit, like I said, you could do this for like all of the trig functions and all of, you know, the natural logarithm and you could do it for power functions and you could do it for everything, but at some point it just becomes unmanageable to memorize all of those, make, make additional rules for every type of function and just sort of understand how to use the chain rule. But this is how the chain rule works when the outside function is an exponential function, like e to the x. So in that case then, you should just get that this is going to be e to the 2t sine of 2t times the derivative of 2t sine of 2t. Now, there's basically just, this is just a product of two functions, right? So I'm just going to break it up. And you could make the two sort of anything you want here. But you have two functions. You have this first function, maybe, and this second function. So you have to use the product. It's a product of two functions. You can use the product rule, right? So it's going to be e to the 2t sine 2t times, so it's the first function, times the derivative of the second function. So what's the derivative of sine of 2t? Well, the derivative of sine is cosine, so it's just going to be cosine of 2t and then times the derivative of 2t, right? The inside function is now 2t. It's not just t, it's 2t. But the derivative of 2t is just 2. So you just get 2t times sine of, or sorry, cosine of 2t. times 2. Okay. And that's the first term. And the second term is going to be the second function, which is sine of 2t. times the derivative of the first function, the derivative of 2t is just 2. So what you could do here is you can just factor a little bit. You could factor out a 2 from both terms here. And you get 2e to the 2t times sine of 2t. And then you'll have here, you'll have 2t cosine of 2t plus sine of 2t. And that's it. Okay. Note that that 2 here came from, that 2 is this 2 and this 2, right? You factor it out. Okay. Any questions on this? Any other questions? Yeah, so like I said, so look for, everyone should have WebAssign access. We've been like four homework assignments now, so um, look for the quizzes on WebAssign. I'll post them on Canvas, but uh, yes, yeah, so starting next week. So there'll be a quiz next week. So again, 
There's no exam next week. So next week, instead of doing review on Tuesday, exam on Thursday, just say it again. Um, we will do section 4.1, 4.2 on Tuesday, 4.3, 4.4 on Wednesday. We will do that over YouTube. We will not be doing it in person, okay? So the same time though. So at 2.20, wherever you are, get out your iPad, your phone, your computer, tune into the YouTube channel, and I'll be giving a lecture just like this. It just will be over the internet. Um, you should be able to answer questions, ask questions. You, should, you can log in and ask questions in the chat. Um, I'll try and come up with a way where maybe you can ask me questions with like, just with your voice, just like you normally would. Um, we'll see how that goes, okay? All right. Uh, let's, any other questions? Ask questions?